Justice Chandrachud, I want to start by asking you straight up about the challenges India's judiciary faces. Uh, at this moment, if you look at the number of uh, pending cases in this country, there are about 4.32 crore total pending cases. 69,000 of them in the Supreme Court, a backlog of about 59 lakh across 25 high courts. Could you start by telling us, all of those who are watching you here at the India Today Conclave, watching live on TV and on social media, about your broad vision to transform, modernize India's judiciary. Let's start from there, Justice Chandrachur. Uh, well, it's true that we have a large backlog of cases, but another way of looking at it is I think it's reflective of the faith of the people uh, in coming to court in the first place, uh, which is not to justify the backlog. We, sh we should be discharging the faith of the people by being more efficient and by reducing the backlog, but that's just an indicator uh, of uh, the kind of faith people have. It also shows that there is a dearth of adequate infrastructure in the judiciary. Our judge to population ratio is not commensurate with what it should be in a country like ours. Uh, that's another problem. Uh, the third problem, of course, is the lack of infrastructure in the district judiciary. But now coming to your question about my vision, I think uh, what we need to do is completely modernize the Indian judiciary. Uh, our model for judicial uh, administration has been based on the colonial model which we inherited from the British, which is that people have to access justice. It's also reflected in the design of our buildings, these grand colonial buildings, which were intended to sort of create a sense of fear and awe about the court in the minds of people. And I think that colonial model now has to give way because justice, to my mind, is not just a sovereign function, which it is, but justice is also an essential service which we provide to our citizens. And part of my mission of dealing with where we should be in the next 50 or 75 years is to transform the Indian judiciary with the use of, with the use of technology. Uh, we saw that in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was unanticipated, uh, possibly unexpected as well. Uh, we couldn't have shut down the doors of courts. We had to keep our courts open because you have to answer the need of citizens who seek bail, their personal liberties are at stake, their lives are at stake, their careers are at stake. So we launched a whole system of video conferencing. And if you'd like me to share the data which I have with me, uh, the kind of work which we did on the video conferencing platform in the pandemic is unprecedented in any part of the world. Uh, so my vision now is that, now that hopefully, COVID is behind us, or almost behind us, as we would like to, because we all live in a sense of optimism. We now look, need to look at technology beyond COVID, and we need to modernize the Indian judiciary. We have already taken a large number of initiatives towards having a more transparent, a more open judiciary. We are live streaming the proceedings in at least some of the most important constitution bench cases. Opening up the court's processes to citizens by live streaming them is part of my mission because it enables citizens to understand what goes on in the court. Uh, many citizens would actually turn up feeling that so much of the work which is done in the court is so very boring. But that, there is a great message which we would like to send to our citizens because the smallest case which comes to us commands the same degree of attention as maybe some of the seminal constitutional cases which we do. How's the experience with live streaming been so far? One of the things we saw in Parliament with our netas is that the moment the cameras are on, the grandstanding goes up. Are you concerned, Chief Justice, that as more and more cases are live streamed, you'll start seeing lawyers uh, being more filmy and more theatrical in their arguments before you? Well, on, in a lighter vein, you always have some professionals who would be given to grandstanding, right? Whether you have a camera in front of them or otherwise, it's not going to make a difference. But I have a sense of optimism, at least my experience thus far, all technology has the good part and the flip side. So likewise, live streaming also has the more difficult part of it. For instance, I'll give you the other, the flip side as well. Very often we are dealing with very sensitive cases involving, say, marital privacy or gender assault or sexual violence against minors. Should you have live streaming in such cases? Obviously not. But therefore, we have the ability to now 
enable the judge in charge to stop live streaming where you feel that the sensitivities of the case far outweigh the public interest in a transparent court proceeding. Some lawyers would grandstand, some private litigants, some litigants in person may do that, uh, but then we must always look at the benefits as well to begin when you make an overall assessment in a holistic perspective. You've spoken in public about your desire to Indianize the Indian judiciary. Do you want to explain what you mean by that to make justice more available to Indian citizens in Indian languages? How do you go about Indianizing the judicial system? I think the first point where we have to start Indianizing the judiciary is in terms of the language of discourse. The language of discourse is not just English in our district courts. For instance, when evidence is given in a murder trial in Maharashtra, the witness would be speaking in Marathi. When a witness deposes in a murder trial in Uttar Pradesh, the witness deposes in Hindi. But the language of discourse in our higher courts, the high courts, and in the Supreme Court is English. Now, that may be a part of our colonial inheritance. It is also because you know, English is the language in which we have the greatest felicity in terms of our statutes, the judgments. But if we have to truly reach out to citizens, we have to reach out to them in languages which they understand. And we've already started that mission. Just to give you an idea, uh, there are about 34,000 judgments of the Supreme Court from 1950 until date. Uh, these 34,000 judgments were available in an official reporter called the Supreme Court Report. So if a private citizen had to access these judgments, you have to subscribe to a private software provider. They are doing excellent work, no doubt about it. But how many young lawyers or citizens across the country can pay 30,000 or 50,000 rupees a year by way of subscription for these kind of reports? So the first thing which I did when I took charge on 9th of November last year was to digitize all the 34,000 judgments. We have a free judgment text portal. We have a search engine so that these judgments can now be searched by a citizen in the country or for that matter, a citizen across the world, anybody across the world. But we haven't stopped at that. We are now using artificial intelligence and machine learning for the translation of these uh, judgments. We have used a module which has been prepared by a very distinguished professor at IIT Madras. And uh, we are now translating all the judgments of the Supreme Court in every Indian language which is recognized by the Constitution. And, and by doing so, we want to reach out to citizens in the language which they follow. Just last week when we were hearing the Constitution bench hearings uh, in, in, the, uh, in one of the very sensitive issues which is before the court and we have reserved judgment now, we have live transcripts of proceedings. So when the lawyer is arguing, we have simultaneously a transcript which is relayed on the screen in the form of uh, a, a complete text. So then the court becomes a court of record. This also in increases the sense of accountability because citizens then know what is argued. Uh, as judges, we are accountable also because we are then responsible for dealing with all the arguments which are made before us. The accountability is, I think, on the part of us as a judicial institution as well. One of the biggest questions, Justice Chandrachud, facing the Indian judiciary at this moment is the manner in which judges are appointed. We've seen a lot of public backlash from the government of the day, asking for changes in the collegium system, which the law minister and others in government believe is not transparent, should be more open, shouldn't be like a judges club. Could you spell out what you think is right and wrong with the collegium system and the manner in which we appoint our judges to the high courts in the Supreme Court? Uh, well, you know, as a Chief Justice of India, I have to take the system as it is given to us today, which is that the collegium system is the prevalent system for appointing judges. Uh, yes, there have been uh, demands for greater transparency, but I must tell you how we work. Uh, for instance, if we are making appointments to the Supreme Court of India, the Chief Justice and the four senior most judges uh, I have actually five because my uh, successor, Chief Justice of India, was not otherwise a part of the collegium, so mine is a collegium of six judges. We look at the judgments which have been delivered, say, in the last three years by the judges of the High Court. And the parameters which we apply for the selection of judges are well defined. First, we look at merit. We look at the professional competence of the judge. 
We constantly analyze judgments of the high court judges when they come up in appeal before us. On an average, we are dealing with about 200 cases every, every week. So those are judgments of the high courts which are coming up before us, so we assess those judgments. But in the collegium, we all read the same judgments at the same time. So we circulate the judgments of the high court judges who are in the zone of consideration. Apart from merit, the second important consideration which we go by is seniority. Because after all, this is a service. It's a service. Judges of the high court are elevated to the Supreme Court. Third important point which we emphasize, that's the need for a broader sense of inclusion. Inclusion in terms of gender, inclusion in terms of the marginalized communities, persons belonging to the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes who must have an equal opportunity to aspire for higher judicial and constitutional offices. Apart from the need for uh, including more gender, uh, having a more gender inclusive judiciary and the marginalized, we also want to bring more minorities into the, into the court. But that is not at the cost of sacrificing merit. Each one of our colleagues who was chosen because she was a woman is as competent as any of her counterparts, the, main, the, the male judges. Likewise for the minorities or for the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, they're as competent as any other judges we have chosen in the recent past. The next important factor which we consider is the need to have a broader sense of dispersal of judicial office throughout the country. It shouldn't be that judicial office in the Supreme Court is confined to only one or two or three high courts. So to the extent it, that it is possible, we try and ensure that we give adequate representation to different segments, different high courts, different states, different regions in, in, in the country when we are making appointments to judge, uh, appointments to the Supreme Court. We also consult judges who have rooted through that high court and who are judges of the Supreme Courts. For instance, I, my parent high court was the High Court of Judicature at Bombay. I was Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court for three years. So when a, ju when a judge from Bombay has to be appointed, I'm consulted. If I have to be appointing a judge from the Allahabad High Court, of course, now I'm the Chief Justice, but when I was a puny judge, I would be consulted for making. And judges give extremely uh, transparent and clear opinions on what they feel. In the high courts, it's even broader because the high courts are looking at lawyers who are fit for appointment. And there are two sources of recruitment to the high court, the district judiciary, and the, the whole track record of the district judiciary is maintained on paper. You have the annual confidential reports. You have a whole dossier on each judge which is developed as they progress through the service. When lawyers are to be appointed, the same procedure is followed. And there is an equal involvement of various stakeholders in the system. For instance, once the High Court Collegium makes its recommendation, the file is processed at two levels. It comes to the Supreme Court, the Government of India, and the Government of the State, so that the Chief Minister of the State, the Governor of the State responds to the appointment which is recommended by the High Court Collegium. At the same time, the file is processed by the Intelligence Bureau to see if there are any adverse intelligence inputs. The file is then it goes to the Union Government in the Ministry of Law and Justice. The Department of Justice sends the file to us with its annotations. We then consult our judges, after which the file is sent back to the government, and then goes on to the Prime Minister's office and then to the President of India. The Supreme Court gave an order recently which said that going forward, election commissioners and the Chief Election Commissioner would be appointed in a panel which includes the Prime Minister, the Chief Justice and a leader of the opposition. So it's not just the government picking the next EC. That is a fantastic idea. Many in government said, but that's also reason why judges should be appointed by people other than just judges. How do you look at all the pressure that's coming your way, saying that the collegium system is not transparent, that this needs to be opened up in a way that judges aren't judging judges, that other people can weigh in, as is the case in many countries internationally? Right. Now, you know, we have adopted a model. We have a career judiciary unlike, say, the United States, where a politician can become, a Secretary of State can, theoretically, and you have had Secretaries of State who have become Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court. We don't follow that model. We follow a model of career judges coming to, the, uh, to either the High Court from the District Judiciary, or career judges from the High Courts coming to the Supreme Court. We, of course, has, have members of the bar as well coming directly to the Supreme Court, as to the High Courts. Since you did mention the issue of transparency, let me emphasize two facets. There's a transparency which operates at two levels. Transparency of the process of appointment 
and transparency in the terms of the choices that you make when you're appointing people. The process has to be completely transparent. And that is why, in recent uh, times, we have been putting out onto the internet, onto our website, the Collegium resolutions. And those resolutions tell society at large, our citizens, what are the parameters we have applied in the selection of judges? Let them judge, let them critique us. I'm not saying that you know any system is perfect, but this is the best that we have developed. And the object of this system, why was this collegium system divine? It was devised for the simple reason that the independence of the judiciary is a cardinal value. And you have to insulate the judiciary from outside influences if the judiciary has to truly be independent. That is the underlying feature of the collegium. That's the underlying purpose of the collegium. But our process is now, processes are becoming now transparent. We have defined what the parameters are. We put our resolutions on the website so that people know whom we have selected, why we have selected them, what are the yardsticks that we have applied. Apart from the processes, and this is the most sensitive aspect which I must share with you because a lot of people perhaps wouldn't know about this. When we consider names for appointment as judges of the High Court or of the Supreme Court, we are also dealing with people's lives, particularly in the High Courts. Very often, the people whose names are under consideration, we look at diverse set of aspects pertaining to their personal lives, their professional lives, their personal lives in so far as they are relevant to the discharge of judicial duties. I have no cause about somebody's personal life if it has no connection with their judicial duties. <coughs> But when we deal with these very personal, intimate, sometimes very, very intimate and private aspects of people's lives, we have to be conscious of the fact that you can't, in the process of selection, open up every aspect of their lives to society at large. The consequence will be that good people will then say, sorry, I'm not, going to, I'm not willing to put my personal life on trial in this particular way. So if you have to have good people, you must also trust your decision makers to make those choices. Law Minister Kiran Rijiju was at the conclave this morning and he was quite upset with the manner in which the Supreme Court had chosen to make public uh, the government's reasons behind withholding permission for somebody to become judge, uh, saying that this is between the government and the judiciary, this should not be made public, there are matters which should be kept private. He didn't like the fact that you were starting to make these public. Well, let me, Lord, join uh, issue with the law minister. Uh, he has a perception. I have a perception. And there's bound to be a difference in perceptions. And what's wrong about having a difference in perceptions? Sometimes there's a difference. <laughs> but we have, to deal with, we have to deal with differences in perception even within the judiciary. I dare say there are differences in perception even within government. But we all deal with it with a sense of robust constitutional statesmanship. Uh, so first and foremost, I don't want to join issue with the law minister for his perception. I respect his perception. And I'm sure that he has a great deal of respect for ours as well. The reason why we put this on the website is in pursuance of the desire of the present collegium to meet the criticism that we lack transparency, and a genuine belief that opening up our processes will foster greater confidence in our citizens about the work which we do. Now, the candidate that you are, the candidate that you are referring to, every aspect that was mentioned in the report of the Intelligence Bureau was in the public domain and is in the public domain. The candidate in question is open about his sexual orientation. So when the IB flagged something, we were not really opening up IB's sources of information. What could be the danger? Let me argue against myself. Somebody, somebody might say, someone might say, that if you put an intelligence report out in the public domain, you might be compromising the sources of information of the Intelligence Bureau on issues of national security. Somebody's life may be in danger. This was not a case like that. The IB report dwelt on the sexual orientation of an openly gay candidate for prospective judgeship. So this was known. It's known to the entire profession. It's been widely reported in the media. All that we said was, while putting it out on the public domain, 
that the sexual orientation of a candidate has nothing to do with the ability or the constitutional entitlement of that candidate to assume a high constitutional office of a high court judge. <laughs> that's all that we said. There's nothing more than that. You spoke, Chief Justice, of the independence of the judiciary. So let me ask you straight up that question, which I'm sure is uppermost in the minds of most people who are sitting here. As Chief Justice, how independent do you think India's judiciary really is? Do you, as Chief Justice, feel you are under pressure when you're giving judgments? I must tell you this. When you talk of pressure, there are various kinds of pressure. Let me make it very, very clear. I've been a judge now. By the end of this month, I'll be, uh, I'll be a judge for uh, 23 years. I'm the longest serving uh, judge in the Indian judiciary. Uh, <laughs> Justice Bobde, Justice Khanvilkar and I, we were appointed on the same day. Your father was the in, longest uh, serving Chief Justice. Chief Justice. Uh, in my 23 years as a, as a judge of the High Court, as the Chief Justice of the High Court, and as a judge of the Supreme Court, no one, and I hope you will trust me when I say this, no one has told me to decide a case in a particular way. No one. We are so clear in the principles which we follow. I wouldn't even talk to a colleague who is presiding over a case and ask them what's going on in that particular case. We have a cup of coffee every morning, but that's, there are some lines which we draw for ourselves. In the high courts, we hear appeals against decisions of colleagues because a decision of a single judge in a high court goes to a division bench of two judges. We are sharing lunch, and I'm hearing an appeal against that colleague. Uh, that colleague's judgment. We never share the fact that I'm sitting in judgment over that judge's uh, judgment. That's part of our training. So there's no question if by pressure you meant a sense of pressure from the executive, from the political arm of government, absolutely no. And I, I hope I'm speaking for the rest of the system as well. But when you talk of pressure in the sense of pressure on the conscience, pressure on your mind, pressure on your intellect, Yes, of course, I'll be a hypocrite if I say that, you know, the cases which come up before us don't give rise to a sense of uh, doubt, a sense of uh, searching for the correct solution. Because particularly in the Supreme Court, you have cases which don't command of one particular solution. It's not, you know, one plus one is equal to two. There's more than one solution to a case which can emerge. And you know that what you are deciding today has wider ramifications for society, not just today but for the future. So a lot of work that we do in the court is based on how we envision our society should be in the future. And when you are deciding something as crucial as the path which our society should take for the future, obviously the judges are going to be in a sense of introspection, a sense of reflection. I don't think I would call that pressure, but just the search for the truth and the search for the correct solution no, is this question is is ahem, 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 आपने अभी थोड़ी देर पहले इलेक्शन कमीशन इलेक्शन कमीशन के निर्णय का जिक्र किया यदि दबाव होता तो क्या ये निर्णय आ जाता इलेक्शन कमीशन जजमेंट इज वन जजमेंट आई कैन गिव यू जजमेंट आफ्टर जजमेंट व्हिच वी डिलीवर विद सच रूटीन इन सच रूटीन मैनर व्हिच नेवर मेक्स द हेडलाइंस इन द न्यूज़पेपर्स बिकॉज़ दीस आर नॉट बिग टिकट जजमेंट्स अफेक्टिंग यू नो सम पॉलिटिकल आर्म और सम पॉलिटिकल इशू the largest litigant in India today is the state. And most of our judgments deal with involvement of the state and its instrumentalities. And we are holding against the state, I'm not just saying government, but against the state in such a large number of issues, whether it's crime, whether it's pensions, whether it's somebody's employment, whether it's somebody's insurance policy. And I don't think that even the government in that sense, and let me be very candid about it, that there is a certain robust nature of our own democracy, which we must have trust in. Uh, we are now living in an age because of social media where we have grown increasingly distrustful of public institutions. 
but we must also understand that over the last 70 years, our democracy has developed very clear and defining lines of the separation between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And I do believe that there is absolutely no issue. We are constantly holding government to account. Courts are speaking truth to power. And I don't think governments are also concerned about it so long as they know their field of demarcation and we know ours. And we know which is the line which separates, say, policy from law, politics from law. Obviously, in some cases, the line is not as easy to define as uh, it would appear in a textbook. But we have to do that exercise, however difficult that exercise is. You know, you've answered this question so expressly. I think that warrants a round of applause, please. I want to ask you next about the quality of judges coming into the Supreme Court and the High Courts at this moment. You spoke of social media as a consequence of Twitter, Facebook. There's now a lot of trolling. We've heard some oral observations about it. Do you, Chief Justice, uh, follow social media? Are you seeing what is being said about you on Twitter, for example, where everybody seems to have an opinion, everybody seems to know, everybody seems to think they know more than the Chief Justice? <laughs> I must, this is, I don't know if this is a confession, but I don't follow Twitter. Um, just for the reason that I, I think, you know, it's important for us not to be affected by the cacophony of extreme views which you sometimes uh, find on, on Twitter. But which is, I have a view on Twitter as well. And I, I think that, you know, social media is a product of the times, not just a product of technology, but a product of our times. Uh, see, 20 or 30 years ago, when you had, say, three or four mainstream newspapers reporting from the Supreme Court, you had the beat reporters say, sitting in the Supreme Court, and they'll pick out an odd case to report. Social media has changed all that. There's live tweeting of every word that is said in the court. Now, that puts an enormous amount of burden on us as well. In our courts, much of the argument which takes place is a dialogue between the bar and the bench. It's not just an address where one lawyer will speak, the judges will keep quiet, the other lawyer will speak, the judges will keep quiet, at the end of it, announce your verdict. That's not the way it is. It's a conversation. It's so typical of our culture. We interrupt each other, we joke, we have serious arguments, there's a little bit of camaraderie even between opponents, so on and so forth. Now, what happens really is this, that what is expressed in a court during the course of a hearing is not the expression of the ultimate view which a judge is going to take. Suppose you are arguing before me, or a lawyer is arguing before me. There are two types of judges. One, and I've appeared before both. I don't know which category I belong to. One type of judges consists of those who play the devil's advocate. Whoever is arguing will get uh, the stick, in the sense the judge will try and find deficiencies in the argument. The other kind of judges, are judges who will stretch an argument to its logical conclusion. So if you're making a point, the judge will stretch your argument and test the limits of the point which you're making. So you have two different personalities, judges who play the devil's advocates and a judge who will stretch your argument. He will take your argument to its logical conclusion. The lawyer feels very nice about it as well. Now what happens as a result of social media is that when there is an expression of opinion by the judge, it's the public seems to believe that this is the way the judge is going to ultimately decide, which is far from the truth. A case is not decided until the last word in the case is said. And I know of so many cases where I have really changed my view, probably at the last minute of the argument, because something very seminal was said at the end of the argument. That's what an open court hearing is all about. And lawyers always tell us this in court, that we are fearful of judges who keep their mouth shut. Because if a judge is quiet in a hearing and doesn't tell you how they believe or what they feel about a case, you don't know which way the judge's mind is working. It's only when the judge is open that you can answer the judge's doubts. But social media sometimes doesn't follow that, or citizens don't follow that. Uh, and I don't blame them, because everybody is not conversant with the processes of the court. So what is the answer? Uh, the answer is not to have a more closed system, but to have a more open system so that people really truly understand the nature of the judicial process. You said you're off Twitter. Do you watch TV? Do you watch television debates? One guy take on another. Does public opinion impact to what extent your thinking and ultimately your judgments? Uh, yes, bits and pieces. But 
Speaking for myself, I try and read as broadly as possible because one of the flip sides about being a judge is the sense of isolation which it breeds. Now, the isolation which we have is possibly the reason why we are independent. We don't mix around too much. Our friends are pretty much friends we made uh, years and years ago. But that's also a problem because your sources of information, your sources of knowledge are therefore confined to what you can absorb. So what I try and do is to read as broadly as possible, as diversely as possible, to try and get a broad cross-section of viewpoints on what is happening in society. Uh, having said that, when a case opens up for hearing, you have to tell yourself that all that you have gathered from outside the four corners of the pleadings in the case has to be kept out, and you will decide the case on the basis of the record before you. That's really part of your training as a judge, which you acquire over the years. It's also of confronting your own biases. We're all human beings. So it would be hypocritical, again, to say that we don't have uh, our own views, our own ideas about various issues of life. But then you have to confront your own self when you are judging and tell yourself that, well, I'm not going to allow my own personal preferences to affect the outcome of this case. Uh, my own lifestyle, my own values, what I learned from my professors, what I learned from my family. Uh, so you, ne you need to be, uh, in that sense, very careful that while you judge others, you're not judgmental of others. And I think that's very important because it's so easy in the office which we occupy. When you're judging others, don't be judgmental. I think there are lots of pearls of wisdom flowing all through uh, this conversation. I want to draw you out on your sense of the quality of judges entering the system at this moment. Your father was the longest serving Chief Justice of India. You've had the longest term in a very long time. Your sons are practicing lawyers. Do you see them entering the judiciary? Would you like them to be part of the judicial system? What's your message to young lawyers practicing out there who are concerned about whether it's worth their while to spend the rest of their lives or the rest of their working lives being a part of India's judiciary? Well, I'll answer the, uh, your, your question at two levels. Am I concerned about the quality of judges? Uh, when I became a judge, or perhaps even before that, uh, when you were asked to become a judge, it was a matter of honor. Nobody said no. Now, increasingly, uh, you find young lawyers whom you ask to become judges of the high court coming and saying, I'm so thankful to you, Chief Justice, but this is not for me. Uh, there may be a variety of reasons not all of it dealing with the emoluments of judges, because I feel that you know whatever you pay a judge, it can never compare with what a lawyer makes. And the reason why you become a judge is not certainly because of you know, you, you know, the perks of the office. That's the least important part of the office. You become a judge out of the mission to do good to others. And there's an enormous amount of good which you can do to society, to others, by being a judge. So I always tell young people two things. If you don't accept judge, judgeship today, then you will get the judges you deserve. They don't complain, you know, 10 years down the line on the quality of judges. You have to have good young people enter the profession and accept, uh, and, and accept judgeship. And honestly, I have no cause to be, uh, you know, to say anything adversely about the service conditions of judges. I'm very happy with what I have. And if, you, if you're not happy with what you have, there's no limit to human greed and to human aspirations. Uh, I believe our service conditions are extremely uh, good, but they can be improved upon, certainly, as, as inflation catches up. Uh, I wouldn't answer the latter part of your question about my own sons. It's a choice for them to make. Well, no, the, thing, of course it's a choice for them to make. I don't know to what extent they listen to their father. That's not the point. The question is, would you like them, to, either of them or both of them, to become judges? You know, I'll tell you, my answer is very simple, and I've had this conversation with uh, them. Now that I've been in the system for 23 years as a judge, and I, I was a lawyer for over 20 years, I find that there is a great amount of good which you can do in society, whether you're a lawyer or whether you're a judge. You can, it depends upon what path you chart out for yourself. Do you want to be a lawyer, one of those lawyers who will only you know, earn more money and more money and more money? Or do you also want to be a lawyer who will also appear for just social causes? appear for people who don't have access to resources, appear for that convict who has been you know, languishing in jail for 20 years without, uh, you know, without uh, an early remission. 
So it depends on what kind of lawyer you want to be. And I do believe lawyers have a very vital role to play in society. I always find that, you know, if I've made a good point in a judgment, it's because of the fact that my eyes were opened by the lawyer who argued that case before me. So similarly applies to the judge. Are you going to be a judge? Years ago, a very distinguished colleague who was a senior of mine in the Bombay High Court told me, that look, you've just become a judge. And there are two choices before you. Do you want to become a judge who will be known for the number of cases that you disposed of, the statistic? Or do you want to be known as a judge for yourself of a person who tried to make a difference to society? The choice is yours. How would you like, once your term is done, Chief Justice, for India to remember your legacy? Well, that's for them to judge. How would you like it to be? <laughs> you know, I think, uh, for me, the bottom line of the work which we do is that no case is ever too big or ever too small. Uh, the smallest grievance of citizens has, I believe in my court, commanded the same respect as a very important constitutional issue which we decide. Because in the small cases which you decide, you touch the lives of human beings. In the important constitutional cases which you decide, you chart the future of Indian society. So there's a great amount to be you know, learned from every bit of the work uh, which you do. There is this perception that why does the Supreme Court have to deal with so many small cases? Mm -hmm. uh, you said that we have about 68,000 cases. There are actually 42,000 cases. 26,000 cases are what we call the connected matters, similar cases. So you know, when we group those cases, a bunch of cases gets disposed of. So the pendency is much less. So a lot of people say that, why does the Supreme Court of India deal with such small cases of bail? You know, uh, th 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 that's one of the arguments which is, uh, my answer is this, no case of bail is a small case because it deals with the personal liberty of a citizen. There are two models of justice which Supreme Courts across the world have adopted. Take the American Supreme Court. The American Supreme Court sits uh, about uh, 80 days in a year. They deal with about 180 cases. They pick out their cases. Our model, which the founding fathers of the Indian Constitution gave us, was a very different model. It was a model based on access to justice. It was a model which saw the transformation of a society from a colonial to an independent society. So when Dr. Ambedkar was drafting these clauses of the Constitution and the other members of the Constituent Assembly, they created a model where the Supreme Court would have its doors open and access to justice would be very broad. The problem with that is, of course, that you have this pendency of cases. But that's for good or bad. I think for the good, that's the model we've adopted. There are quite a few people who think our judges are a lot. The judges, the courts are shut for way too long, given especially the pendency. How do you respond to this general sense in society that judges are off for too long? And how do you think we can reduce pendency? OK. So I'm, I'm really thankful to you for asking me this question. Because, I thought you'd be uh, angry with me for asking No, I'm, I, this, this really, it's a very serious issue, and I must answer this uh, as, as candidly as possible. People see us sitting in court from 10.30 to 4. We handle between 40 and 60 cases every day in the Supreme Court. The work which we do between 10.30 and 4 every day in the Supreme Court is a fraction of the work which we do. In order, to be, in order to be ready to deal with the other cases which are going to come up the next day, you spend an equal amount of time in the evenings reading for the next day. Our judgments are in reserve. So on Saturdays, typically, every judge of the Supreme Court will sit down and dictate judgments. On Sunday, all of us sit down and read for Monday. So without exception, and I'm not speaking for myself, without exception, every judge of the Supreme Court works for seven days in a week. When it comes to the holidays, look at what the other Supreme Courts of the world are doing. The American Supreme Court, I have the statistics here before me. The American Supreme Court would sit for, can I just take a second to uh, yeah, give you certainly. The, Just give me a moment, just a moment. See, I see you were expecting that curveball. Uh, <laughs> The, yes. The American Supreme Court sits about eight to nine days in a month, annually 80 days, and don't sit for three months in a year. The Australian High Court, 
So it's about two weeks in a month, annually less than 100 days, no sittings for two months. Singapore sits for 145 days in a, in a year. The UK almost the same as us. The Supreme Court of India sits for about 200 days uh, every year. What people don't know is this, that most of the time in the vacation is spent on preparing judgments which you have kept in reserve because you have just no time during the week when you are working seven days just trying to keep ahead of the curve to deal with your cases. So vacation time is really time spent. The last vacation, the winter vacation, I was sitting with my five judicial clerks, uh, keeping up on abreast on all the judgments which I had to deliver. Yes, at the end of it, in the summer vacation, you will get a week off with your family to travel. But another thing which we must bear in mind is judging is not about just disposing cases. It's not just about the statistic. It's about thinking through your cases. It's about reading the law reading about where the law is going in other jurisdictions, thinking about where you want our society to be in terms of the output which you are going to produce. So unless you give your judges time to introspect, reflect, think about the work which you are going to do, you're not going to have quality of justice. You know, you were saying that you're working even when you're on holiday. Your wife is sitting in the audience and I could see she was nodding her head when you were saying that you're working even while on holiday. We're out of time, Chief Justice. I started by saying that uh, you used to moonlight as a radio jockey uh, in your 20s. You listen to the music of the lawyers during working hours. When you're back home, what music do you listen to? I listen to a variety. I, lo I love uh, on Indian classical. I'm a great fan of uh, Kumar Gandharva. Uh, Gana Saraswati Kishori Amonkar, but I love Western music as well. I'm a great fan of uh, Bob Dylan. And uh, on a difficult day to uh, court, I also have my own collection of the ABBA, which I listen to. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you also are fond of cricket. Do you get any chance to watch any of the matches? Do you have like a screen on? Um, uh, it's getting increasingly more difficult just because of the, uh, the pressure on time. Not the pressure on the mind, but the pressure on time. But uh, I do uh, pick up bits and pieces of the replays at the end of the day before I call it a day in the if night. If you were a batsman, who would you, who'd you be like? Uh, Rahul Dravid. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of meaning in that to say that you're batting like Rahul Dravid, strong, straight and reliable. I started by saying, and by referring to that one cup in his library, he's very embarrassed about it. Okay? He's going to be very upset that we refer to that cup which says Rockstar DYC. <laughs> and I think over the past 45 odd minutes, all of you sitting here at the conclave and those of you watching at home got a first-hand experience of why those who come in touch with Justice Chandrachud, who've seen his work, why so many of them think that he's an absolute rock star. For coming to the conclave, for agreeing to this request, when we'd reached out to you and approached to you, you'd said that you know, it'll be nice to have a frank conversation, which is what it's been. You've spoken from the heart. You've given us a sense of your judicial luminance. Thank you so much, Justice Chandrachud, for joining us. Can I request everyone seated here to stand up and give a warm round of applause as we thank very dearly Justice Chandrachud, Chief Justice of India, for coming to the conclave and answering questions. You know, it's, it's very easy to ask questions, but when so much can turn on every single sentence that you say, it takes a lot of courage, or as you said, it takes the confidence of being the Rahul Dravid of the judiciary to be able to come up here and do this. We're very thankful to you, your Lordship. Thank you, sir. Absolute pleasure and honor. Thank you, sir.